different is our other classes had an opportunity to kind of have a lackadaisical day to day, but they've got more work to do outside of class. And so you guys are going to jump in and, and learn stuff right off the bat. We're going to jump into chapter one. You completed the R chapter and um, we're going to start learning about algebra in here. So this first page here, I, I get into a discussion of why algebra. And I think this is pretty important. Um, you know, when you first saw algebra as a child, uh, it was a mixture of letters and numbers. And, you know, in your past, as a child, letters were always with English and numbers were always with math. And so algebra became a learning hurdle for a lot of early students just because of this mix of ABCs and 123s. And one could say, well, why did they do that? You know, why, what is the benefit? What is the value? It's an awesome question. And the answer is really powerful. Has anybody ever heard the phrase economy of scale? Economy of scale. Anybody heard this phrase before? Know what it means? Anybody willing to share if they know what it means? Okay. So who in here is majoring in business or wants to get into business? Raise your hands. Okay. All right. So you're going to learn about economy of scale in business. It's an economic term. And so let's say that we start a company. Our class starts a company. And um, we, we call our company Fetchers. Okay, it's the name of our company. And we sell everything to deal with you know, the brand Fetchers. So we're gonna sell shoes instead of Skechers, they're Fetchers, right? Okay? And we're gonna sell chips. Instead of Fritos, they're gonna be Fetcheritos, okay? And we got all kind, we got swag, right? We're gonna have like FOA, Fetchers of America. Okay, we got all kinds of stuff. And so we're selling this here at BYU-Idaho, and let's say we profit, over a semester, we profit $10,000 profit on all of our Fetcher gear that we sell, okay? All right, so the economy of scale is, the big question is somebody comes and analyzes our company and they say, hey, how do we scale this? Okay. Has anybody ever seen a Matchbox car? Little, those little Matchbox cars? Yes? Okay. Has anybody ever turned it upside down and looked at the bottom? You know what's on the bottom? Company. Company. I have Matchbox and Hasbro, Limited, LTD, that kind of thing. Okay. But there's other stuff on the bottom. Does anybody know? Scale. Scale. There's the make and model of the car. So if you have a little Corvette, it'll say Chevy Corvette or Chevrolet Corvette or whatever. And then there'll be a scale and it'll say 1 colon 32 or 1 colon 64. And they're basically telling you, if you multiplied every dimension of that car times 32, you'd have, you'd have a full-blown Corvette in your living room, okay? Or multiply every dimension by 64, and you'd have a full-blown Corvette in your living room, right? So when we talk about scaling something, we're saying, hey, how can we make this bigger, okay? How can we make it bigger? So if the Fetcher's company is making us $10,000 profit a semester, like, okay, that's great, but could we make $100,000 a semester off of this? You know, how could we scale this? And so we start looking at, you know, other schools we can sell to, you know, you know, other venues, stuff like that, right? So algebra helps us scale things. Let me give you a prime example. How much tithing do we pay on $500 earth? 50 bucks. Okay, so Mormons are the fastest group of people to find 10% of any number, okay? We can do it without a calculator, and we can do it with any number, all right? So 10% of $5,000 is because you knew, believe it or not, algebra, okay? So if somebody walks through that door, and they're not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they walk in that door, and they are part of this conversation, they're like, how the fetch did you figure that out? And all they know right now, all they know right now is how to find tithing when they earn $500. They know that when their income equals $500, their tithing equals $50. Who has ever heard the statement, um, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime? Who's ever heard that before? Yeah? Okay, that is the economy of scale. That's saying, I can feed you, I can give you a fish, and I can take care of you for one day. I invest in you, teach you how to fish, now there's unlimited meals for you, right? That's the economy of scale. So what does this have to do with math? Well, somebody comes in here and I teach them, hey, when you earn $500, you pay $50 tithing. 
okay? So now you know if you earn $500, what your tithing is. Then if I say, if you earn $10,000, okay, uh, your tithing is $1,000. Okay, now you know how to pay tithing on $500 and $10,000. Okay, I've given you two fishes. But if I tell you to memorize this equation, sorry, Tithing equals 10% of, which means times, income. 10% notice is converted to a decimal. I told you once before, we can't work with percents as they stand. We're going to have to convert them, use conversions. You now know how to fish. Because you can plug any amount of income into this equation and determine tithing. So why algebra? Well, algebra incorporates letters with numbers and the letters are variables that represent any value. And now I can create an equation that scales this knowledge to not just one or two instances, but to every instance. Does that make sense? That's the power of algebra. That's why algebra exists, is that we need to be able to do this. And what's interesting is the same equations that can scale our company to be really big, okay, use algebra. They have to, because now we're taking variables into, a, into account. And what does a variable mean? Well, the very word very, V-A-R-Y, is invariable, okay? And the word variable is the word very. And, and so we're saying our answer can vary. It's not just a set answer all the time. It's not always $50. It's not always $1,000. It can vary because of the equation. So what is a variable? Write this down. A variable is a letter or symbol. A variable is a letter or symbol whose value can vary or change. So what is a constant? What's the opposite of a variable? It stays the same. It's a value or symbol that never changes. The number three is a constant. The symbol pi is a constant. Okay? Pi is not a variable. It's a symbol, but it never changes. We good? Let's go to the next page. I believe in this statement. Somebody read that top statement in bold. What does it say? The top one in bold. Beauty in simplicity. Yeah? Who's a no makeup girl in here? Anybody? We got no, any no makeup girls? Yeah? You believe in beauty and simplicity, don't you? Yeah. A lot of women do. Okay? I think there is beauty in all things in life that we keep simple. We get too complex. Um, I remember for years, uh, and, and this is on a YouTube video, my wife's gonna shoot me on this, but I remember for years, when I first married my wife, we would try to go to the gym, and she liked to go to the gym for like two, three hours. And you know, I'd go once with her and then I'd, I'd never go again, because it's just like, I, I, I can't do this. I can't take two to three hours a day to go to the gym. Like, that's just not feasible in my life, okay? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in simplicity. You know, go to the gym, you know, have a single muscle group that you're honing in on. You know, I don't know, do eight to 12 different sets with that muscle group, get out. You know, do that consistently three to five times a week, you're gonna be in good shape. You know, and, and over time, you're gonna be in better shape than you would be if you don't go to the gym. Right? But if you're like, well, I gotta, I gotta spend two to three hours in the gym, it's just gonna be really unsustainable, right? So simplicity is a beautiful thing. Um, I believe what I'm about to tell you about algebra, if you had learned what I'm about to teach you the first time you took algebra, you probably aren't in this class. 90% of you would not be in this class today if you learned what I'm about to teach you. So this is kind of a fun little lecture, and um, some of you are gonna giggle, some of you are gonna be embarrassed, but you're gonna handle it, because we're all adults, okay? 
So, uh, little children and adults like kittens and puppies. Who doesn't like a cute little, you know, puppy or kitten? Who doesn't like it? It's okay. You don't like either of them? No? Oh my. I, I, this is interesting, fascinating. What do you like? Like anything newborn? Like newborn children? Sure. You're like, I kind of got to say yes. No. I mean, when I was your age, I didn't like newborn children. They look like a lot of work, you know? So anyways, all right. You got this fuzzy little newborn uh, puppy or kitten, okay? What do children want to know? What do, what do you think is the first question they ask when they see a newborn puppy or kitten? Where'd it come from? That's a good question. Okay. What? Can I touch it? Okay. Can I have it? Hold it? I like these questions. Okay. So I gotta be honest with you, man. I see I'm a little child, and somebody says, here's a little puppy, and I and I hold it, right? And I wanna know if I can have it, something like that. I'm probably not going to go existential and be like, you know, where does this come from? <laughs> like, I mean, maybe later I might ask, you know, especially if you were part of the, you know, kind of breeding birthing process, you know, and you're like, where did this come from? You know, that makes total sense. I've seen my kids do that. But I can tell you, I've had, I've had six children and we bred puppies for a while and they invariably asked, is it a boy or a girl. That's the number one question they would ask. Is it a boy or a girl? That's the first thing they wanted to know. And I think they ask it because they want to they want to connect with it and relate to it. If it's a boy, it's like me, or if it's a girl, it's like her, you know, that kind of a thing. And they kind of bond with it. Oh, I hope it's a girl, I hope it's a boy like me. Okay? All right. So how do we determine if it's a boy or a girl? There we go. Here comes the giggles. I giggle about this stuff too. How do we determine if it's a boy or a girl? Come on. What's that? Look, wow, you're going for the glory here. He's not, he's no mixing of words. Look for the penis. Okay, all right. So, sure. So, we're going to lift up the tail or lift it up by its hindquarters, and we're going to check its anatomy, okay? We're going to check its anatomy, all right? Guess what? There are two sexes, okay, male and female, when it comes to, you know, living species. <laughs> oh, I, we can't say this on YouTube. I can't do this. All right. Anyways, pause it for a second. All right. You have to understand one or the other. You determine it through the anatomical structure. Math is no different. Two types of problems in all of algebra, solved and simplified, there is a singular anatomical structure that tells you if you're a solved problem or a simplified problem. If you guys get this, oh man, you're bad A's. And I don't mean apples. Okay, what, what is the anatomical structure? Do you know? A mathematical anatomical structure that determines if you're a solver or a simplified problem. Say it, say it. Equal sign. Equal sign. Yeah, baby. I'm buying you guys donuts, man. We're going to, it's like donuts or pizza? Donuts. 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 Okay, I'm bringing donuts. And if I don't bring them within the next week, you need my brother Rich, man. With my freaking donut. <laughs> donuts. I need my donuts. Okay, all right, but I'm bringing you donuts because you guys are smart, okay? It is the equal sign. So check this out, okay? A solved problem has equal signs, okay? Or sign, I guess it just has one, okay? <laughs> There's no two penises, okay? <laughs> Don't go there, okay? All right? And then there is a simplify, okay? <laughs> Whoa. We get all kinds of creepy in here. Okay, it's a simplify problems, and they don't have equal signs. Okay, okay. So a solved problem has an equal sign. A simplified problem does not. A solved problem would be like three x equals fifteen, right? Three x equals fifteen. What does x equal? Five. It equals five. You can do that in your head. Look up here, please. But if I take 3x and divide it by 3, what I do to one side, I do to the other side. We're going to learn that rule. It's called the balance rule. We're going to divide this by 3. This cancels. We get x equals 5. And what you did in your head, we can do with algebra. And we're going to learn how to do this with much bigger problems here in the next week. But that's a solved problem. And we literally find out what the variable equals. That's our purpose. Simplify problem. 2x plus 3x. What's the answer to that problem? Say it loud. But, 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 Brother Rich, what, what's X? Well, we don't fetch and care, and we don't fetch and know, because that's not the purpose of that problem. 
This is a clean your bedroom problem. Simplify means to put it in its cleanest, simplest form. Two X's and three X's combine to make five X's. But, 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 but what's X? We don't know. And we don't fetch in care because there's no equal sign. That's not the objective here. So how many of you have ever had a job? Raise your hand if you've ever been paid to do a job, okay? Those of you who've been paid to do a job, how many of you had a job where you did not, like literally you were doing a job, working for somebody, you're like, what am I supposed to do? Like, <laughs> what's my purpose? Like, literally, you've been, you've been hired to do a job for somebody, and then you literally are like, like, what's my objective? I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Who's ever been confused? You're like, what am I supposed to do in this job, right? Keep those hands up. For those of you who've been confused, how many of you are still working that job? Keep your hand up, okay? You're still working that job, okay? I predict you will not be there that long, okay? It definitely won't be a career for you, okay? See, here's the deal. I hire people all the time. And the most important thing when I try to find somebody of value and bring them into my company is I have to have clear objective of this is your job title, this is what your objectives are, and this is how you accomplish them, and this is how you get paid more, right? And if they don't, if they don't, uh, if they don't know that, my wife's out there. If they don't know that, okay, she's taking a picture of me with her phone. I don't know. She's been crazy on me today, man. Crazy on me. Why? I wish she'd come in here. But she's, I think she sees we're videoing or something. So you don't want to interrupt. Okay? So, have you ever met my wife? Has she ever come in here? Oh, crap, man. Pause it. So, it's the same thing in this class. We have to know our objectives. Stay here, soon. We have to know our objectives. Every time we do a problem, we got to know what's my purpose. So I'm telling you, there's only, there's only two purposes. There's only two purposes, and it's either to solve the problem and literally find out what the variable equals, or to simplify, clean up the problem, and put it in its simplest state. We cool? Let's pause. What Tony just shared with you guys is really cool in the sense that, you know, it's the same exact concept of knowing your why. But think about it. If you have a job and you don't know your why there, it's just really hard to be motivated to accomplish a lot. That's why I say, for me as an employer, I want my employees to capture their why, because if they're good employees, they're hard to come by, and I want them to stay with me, right? So Layman and Lemuel and Nephi, like Layman and Lemuel never invested in knowing their why, because they never invested in knowing the God who created them. And they said, straight up, oh, we know not, you know, the dealings of our God, you know? He make none of this known to us. And, and it's interesting because Nephi chastises him at that moment because he's like, yeah, they basically were admitting, we don't keep the commandments. That's what they're saying. We don't keep the commandments, so we, we don't get to talk to God and, and ask him, you know, and, and, and we're not praying and doing that stuff, right? Okay? You got to know your why, and it'll keep you motivated in the things you do, whether it's your work, your, your spirituality, or even in this class in algebra. So here's our why right here, solve and simplify. We cool? Okay, so what does this have to do with this chapter? Well, nothing specifically, but everything generally. Because I like to take the beginning of a chapter sometimes and use that moment to talk about something more general about what we're going to learn. And really, that had to do everything what we're going to learn for the rest of the semester because we are getting done with the Karate Kid Basics and we're heading into algebra. First concept I want to talk about is the simple concept of substitution. Okay. What does it mean to substitute? What's the definition of substitution? <coughs> to replace, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, it says right here, what is an algebraic expression? Write this down. An algebraic expression, you don't need to write that down. It's basically, it is a math statement with variables. It's a math statement with variables. So, two plus three equals five. Is that an algebraic expression? No. X plus three equals five. Is that an algebraic expression? Yes. Okay, absolutely. Okay, and what does X equal? It does equal two, but this is an arithmetic expression and this is an algebraic expression because it has variables in it. Clear? Okay. What do we do when we're told to evaluate the algebraic expression 2x plus y over 2 when x equals 3 and y equals 2. What do we do? Plug in variables first. Okay, plug in, replace, substitute. This is the concept of substitution. So if you'd like to right now, you could circle the word evaluate 
And right above it, you can make a little arrow say substitute. Evaluate something is going to use the principle of substitution. So we take uh, 2x plus y over 2, 2x plus y all over 2. And where there's an x, what are we going to put in? A 3. And where there's a y, we're going to put in a 2. two because it said, you know, evaluate, evaluate when x equals 3 and y equals 2. Okay? And this is all over 2. So what's 2 times 3? Six. 6. And plus 2, it makes 8. And so this is 8 over 2, which equals 4. Okay. So I want to ask you something. Look at this problem right here. Look at this problem right here. Was there an equal sign right here? No. no. So is this solve or simplify? Simplify. It's simplify. When we evaluate something, we're just simplifying it. Okay? And we did that. We plug those values in. Okay? And then we just simplify that all the way down to 4. Okay? This... And this, or sorry, this and this are the same. They are, but this is its simplest form. Cool? Okay, let's go to the next page. I want you guys right now to evaluate these two problems on your own. Let's pause. So tithing equals 0 0.10 income, and it's telling us that we're making an income. It says I equals 355,000, and they're asking us to evaluate this expression, this algebraic expression, because it has variables in it, when income equals $355,000. Is this, does this have an equal sign? Mm -hmm. It does, so it's a solve problem. So we're gonna say T, and we're solving because we don't know this variable, tithing. T equals 0 0.10, 355,000. What's the answer? 35,500. You can either move the decimal, you know, two places or whatever. I don't know. I can't remember. Oh, two places? I don't know. Fetch me. Okay, anyways. You just do it on the calculator. I'm messing with you. Okay, you good? What's our next one? 2x plus 3y equals 5. 2x plus 3y, uh, sorry, over 5. Uh, and they asked us to evaluate this when x equals 5 and y equals equals 10. Was there, a, was there a, an equal sign in this problem? No. Nope. So we're plugging these in and simplifying it. Okay. And it, it makes sense. We're not solving for a variable. They already have values given to you. This one, we didn't know what T was. We got to solve for it. So we have 2 times 5 plus 3 times 10 all over 5. 2 times 5 is 10 plus 30 over 5 makes 40 over 5 equals what? Eight. Say what we got it right. Okay. Last thing here. Let's do problem number one from the homework. So you don't need to go to your homework because um, we have uh, this problem uh, right here written for us. It says it takes a tutor 23 minutes less to do a math problem than Brother Rich. Do you think that's true? Fetch. No. I'm faster than those fetching tutors. I hope. Some of them were faster than me at some of these things. But um, I, had a, I had a student that helped me write this, um, write a lot of our problems in here, and she was always trying to fetch with me, you know. Did she make little problems like, you know, Brother Rich tried on three dresses. And I'm like, dude, we can't write that. Just stop, okay, man. But she'd do stuff like this, you know, just to mess with my mind, you know. The tutors are better than you, Brother Rich. I'm like, stop. It ain't happening, okay? So it takes a tutor 23 minutes less to do a math problem than Brother Rich. X stands for the time it takes Brother Rich to do a problem. So the time it takes Bro Rich to do a math problem is symbolic of X. If the tutor takes 23 minutes less than I do on a regular basis, then the tutor's time, okay, the time for the tutor to do it, is what? It's x minus 23. Makes sense. So then at the end of the problem there, they say, well, uh, how fast can a tutor do a math problem that takes Brother Rich 45 minutes? So if my time is equal to 45 minutes, what is the tutor's time? 45 minus 23 equals 22. You know, again, simple substitution. We're substituting the minutes in for the variable. Okay? And then the next one was what? 93 minutes, so 93 minus 23 equals what? 70 minutes, okay? Hard or easy? 
Can you see that there's not a lot of work to show in the homework tonight? Okay, not a lot of work to show so far. Let's go to our next page. So I want you to look at this with me briefly. So you have three assignments tonight, and we haven't even discussed the syllabus assignment. We're going to discuss that at the end of class, but we're focusing on this. But right now, this is one of your assignments. This is page 98 in your workbook, and you have these two charts. And you really need to be very familiar with these charts. You need to have some of it memorized, some of it uh, you just need to be familiar with. Uh, things that are in bold, like more than, less than, of, are big ones that we really, really need to understand. But right here it says, take five minutes to rewrite these two charts on the adjacent page. If you look at the adjacent page, it's a blank page, right? Can I see this really quick? So for those of you at home, you got this right here. Okay, you got the charts, you got a blank page. I want you to write these charts over here exactly as they appear here. And you can say, why are we wasting our time doing this? Right, well, if we didn't have a workbook, I would write it on the board and you'd write it in your notes. And when we write things, we learn things. And these two charts are two things you need to learn. So I want you to write them, okay? But not in class. I want you to do it on your own, all right? You cool? Okay, turn the page. So we're gonna talk about some of these algebraic expressions and you may need to, you may need to um, go back and forth a couple of times and look at some of this, but I think you can get this. <coughs> So we have sometimes algebraic expressions sometimes are written out in, in full word length and we need to translate them into more of a mathematical statement to make them usable to do the math we need to do, whether it's solve or simplify them. So up there in that blue box, we have um, an algebraic expression that says seven more than some number. Seven more than some number. So the first thing it tells you to do is this number one says, write out the algebraic expression on one line. And students say, well, what does that mean, Brother Rich? Okay, what if I did this? Seven more than some number. Did I write that on two lines or one line? Two. Two lines or one line? One. That's what it means to write it on one line. And the reason we want to write it on one line is because we want to, in step two, we want to do what's called drop-down translation. So when we see the word seven, we turn that into its numerical value, seven. We see the expression more than, we look at those charts, is more than an expression of adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. Which one? Adding. adding. So that means plus. And some number means the variable. And you can pick any letter you want for a variable, but the most common one picked and used is X in algebra, okay? Hard or easy? Pretty easy stuff, okay? So we use the concept of drop-down translation. Um, I want you to ignore this statement here for just a minute. I want you to look at these. Some of our top translations is always means equals of, that one confuses people a lot, it always means to multiply, and some number or what number always means the variable. So I want you to, I want you to join me. We're going to quickly translate uh, these three on the bottom left here. Do them with me, okay? C more than D. C more than D. What are we going to write? C plus D. Done. Hard or easy? Fetch and easy, man. Eight more than some number. Eight more than D. Some number. What do you do? Eight, Eight plus, plus what? X, Y, whatever variable you want. And then we have twice some number. Twice some number. What is the answer? 2X. That's it, man. Or 2Y or 2Z or 2A. We cool? All right. So you can see how these drop down translations really work. It just drops straight down as it reads. But there is an exception. In fact, there's two exceptions to drop-down translation. The expression less than and the expression subtracted from translate opposite. And so I want to show you what that means. Five minus some let's actually do this. Five minus some number. Need my eraser. 
okay? Five minus some number, all right? Help me, what is this? Five. Number five, minus, minus, some number, x. x, super easy. But then if we see the exact same thing, but it says less than instead of minus, five less than some number, we know that less than is add, subtract, multiply, or divide. It is subtract, five less than some number. So here we go, again we have five, but now we gotta do something interesting here. The five has to come over to this side, and the sum number has to come over here, so that's x, and less than stays in the middle, minus. What if I say, let x equal seven? What's five minus seven? What's five minus seven? Everybody, five minus seven? Negative two. Negative two. What's seven minus five? Two. It's just two. So does it make a difference where the x goes? Oh, absolutely. So less than always swaps positions. Okay, so does subtracted from. If I say five subtracted from some number, it would be x minus five, okay? So let's do these last two examples. Five less than twice some number. Five less than twice some number. All right, everybody, please listen to Coach Rich here. Your homework tonight. Not a lot of work to show, but you're to write that statement on your homework and then drop down translate. That's why I wrote it out here. Five is five, less than is what? Oh, it's a minus, but whenever you see less than, where's the five have to go? I have to go to the other side, so we're gonna say, yeah, I see ya, put the five over here. And then this has to come to this side, twice some number. How do you express that? Two X. Two X, so it's two X minus five, good job, okay? Let's do the last one and just look at it and do it out loud. M subtracted from N. What variable comes first? N, N minus M. M. And we're done, okay? All right. That covers everything in section 1.1. Let's go ahead and end that video.